Well, welcome. My name is Roger Ballard. I am proud to be the CEO of New Vision Credit Union, and we're really excited to be with you here for our final uh, Beacon Economics webinar of 2023. Uh, this is, I believe, our fourth that we've been doing, and it's been great to hear from Dr. Chris Thornburg and get his insights about the economy. We really hope you're going to find this uh, this webinar to continue to be very interesting and valuable and, and maybe thought-provoking as well. So uh, really excited to have Chris with us again. We're going to be uh, you know, talking about all things economic, uh, particularly as we, you know, think about how how we're wrapping up 2023 and as we think about going into uh, 2024. So, you know, we started this series uh, back in March to make sure members have access to the latest information and tools for your financial su success. When we have information that helps you make uh, decisions in your life. So there's been a lot of questions about the economy this year, uh, understandably. And we really want to empower you with information so that you can make decisions that are appropriate for your life and appropriate in terms of you achieving uh, your goal. So we're really uh, honored to be here and I'm thrilled to have Chris uh, with us here. Dr. Thornburg is an outstanding expert uh, in, in the economy and has some great insights. I've learned so much in the webinar so much and I expect to learn even more and I, we hope that you do uh, as well. Well, all of these Beacon Economic uh, webinar series uh, have had the opportunities, and this one too, for you to ask your questions via Zoom. So if you look at your Zoom screen, and kind of at least uh, as I look at my screen, I think it's similar to yours, you'll uh, look on the, the lower part of it, and you'll see the, the Q&A icon. So at any time during, the, uh, during this webinar, you can click on that icon, and you can submit your questions. And then after Chris uh, goes through his presentation, uh, the we'll, at part of the wrap up, we'll uh, try to go through those questions as many as we have time for. We have about an hour in total, so that's what we're going to try to to go to. And uh, looking forward to engaging with any of your questions. So if you just click on that Q and A icon and then type your question in the box, we'll try to get to that uh, toward the end of the session. So again, really happy to have Dr. Uh, Chris Thornburg here with us today. He uh, has earned national recognition for his expertise in economic forecasting and has just been fantastic in our other webinars, and we're so thrilled to have him uh, here. And so, Chris, uh, without further ado, welcome, and thanks again for being here. No, oh, thank you very much, Roger. It's been a fun year, to say the least, and certainly a very interesting one. We've had no shortage of interesting news stories, and yeah, I tell you what, first of all, let's start off by saying happy holidays, everybody. Uh, it, it is great to be here. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed uh, my stage time, so to speak, in this virtual world um, with New Vision over the course of the last few quarters. Today, we're going to do a couple things. Um, first of all, I want to wrap up 23. We're coming in. It's the, the holidays. Where are we coming out of 2023? What are those big growth trends? Those growth trends, I want to start talking. I'm going to fade away from those and talk a little bit about the local situation. In fact, I want to spend a lot of time tonight talking about labor force and labor force issues, which is not nearly talked about enough. And I know it's it's a profound issue, uh, particularly in, in some of these markets that we are talking to with New Vision, Anchorage, of course, Southern California, are places where labor shortages are really having a profound impact on things. Uh, we're obviously going to talk a little bit about how we got to this part of, of time. And then last but not least, I'm going to uh, do a little bit more on the psychology of miserableism. You may have heard me use that term over the last couple of seminars. Now we're going to break briefly, a couple of Q&A at that point in time. The most important part of this whole thing, of course, is the second half, which is what is the outlook for 2024? And on that basis, there's three big things we want to talk about. The consumer, interest rates, and housing markets. But I also want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the federal government as well. So with all that, there's a lot of stuff here. As always, I have too many slides. Um, some of this is repeats. So we're going to buzz through them quick. Uh, so buckle up. Here we go. All this year, we've been dealing with this, of course. It was about roughly the beginning middle of 2022 when the big, of course, siren calls of, uh, of recession started to happen. And, you know, it's funny. Hearing all this stuff, it does remind me that that my particular uh, occupation, being an economic forecaster, has, shall we say, a bit of a checkered history. Uh, it's pretty clear that this call was indeed incorrect, and it, you know, it does bring me back to a, a famous curmudgeon, John Kenneth Galbraith, in the economic field, who, who once famously said that the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. Um, again, I I, I took that 
wrong, but nowadays I see where he's coming from. Now, we understand the big news stories. We've had the hike in interest rates, the surge in inflation, decline in consumer confidence. And candidly, even towards the end of the year, people are still not happy. There was an interesting presidential poll that came out today, and, and only 23% of Americans think the econ economy, the country, is, is headed in the right direction. So still a, a palpable amount of, shall we say, frustration in the American public out there. But as for the recession itself, well, obviously that hasn't shown up. And we've mentioned this last couple of times, Beacon Economics, we, we contribute to the Wall Street Journal economic forecast. Uh, they have a recession probability number. We were basically the low guys there for quite a while. Now, of course, even those forecasters are starting to say, starting to recognize that we're not going to have a recession. And we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, uh, by this point in time, uh, the third quarter numbers are, are in, and they were just as good as I talked about last time around. Overall, about 5% growth in the third quarter of last year. Uh, that puts 2020, 20, 2022, excuse me, 2023, on a, about a 3% growth rate. Good, solid numbers coming from consumer spending. Business investment continues to run strong. <clears throat> spending on non-residential structures this year picked up and despite all those increases in interest rates, the trade deficit's closing. Lots of great numbers. And while it's too early to call the fourth quarter just yet, the preliminary numbers suggest uh, still another 2% growth. So 2023 is, is ending on a strong note. We're going into 2024 with, with plenty of, of momentum. And of course, this is all based on the mighty American consumer. The ongoing uh, spending by the American public, good steady trends that began prior to the pandemic. We're still on that trend. And you can look at the at the at the changes in overall spending. If you look at real spending today relative to pre-pandemic, it's amazing what, what's really jumped. Recreational goods and vehicles up 60%. Furnishings are up, clothing, motor vehicles. Um, people are having fun. There's been a 38% increase in restaurant spending since prior to the pandemic. I like Las Vegas gaming revenues. It's a great uh, metric for the American public. And they're at an all-time high right now, despite, of course, the fact that the convention business is not fully back and you don't have a lot of those foreign visitors coming in. Live Nation is having a record year. They can't hold the concert without it selling out completely. The auto sector is finally starting to catch up. My little bit of good news here is that auto inventories, cars for sale, have gotten to about 200,000 you can actually find a tiny bit of a selection nowadays on, on lots. Um, one of the results of that is, is used car prices are starting to come down. They're still much higher than they were prior to the pandemic. Again, this is an industry that's still trying to catch up rather than dealing with diminished demand. Uh, travel continues to run strong. Uh, the U.S. spending abroad continues to run at a uh, all-time high level. A little better news in the third quarter, we're starting to see increases in Visitors from abroad coming to the United States, an important part of our economy. That's coming back as well. Uh, if you traveled over Thanksgiving and it was a miserable experience, well, you're not alone. Turns out we had a record number of travelers in the United States in 2023. This is over the last month. This is TSA throughputs, people going in and out of the airport. 2023, the last uh, 35 days, 80 million people traveled, all-time record in terms of travel in the United States. Inflation has been cooling off. One of the big stories, of course. Overall numbers, you can see on the right-hand side, you can see non-durable inflation almost down to 0%. Durable prices are actually falling a little bit at this particular point in time. A housing is still pretty expensive. That is on an uptick. But again, again, a lot of those pressures are coming off the consumer public. On the left-hand side, this is year-over-year -year changes in retail sales. Remember, these are nominal, so there are some price effects in there. But you can see, again, restaurants, Still very busy, non-store retailers, it's online stuff doing well. The energy situation, last time we were concerned a little bit about energy prices. Well, energy prices have backed off. The West Texas Intermediate's coming down. Natural gas prices are down. Now, by the way, this is good for the overall U.S. forecast. It obviously has a more negative connotation for our friends in Wyoming and Alaska, who, of course, rely on these prices, but they are coming down. Uh, one of the reasons prices are coming down, U.S. oil production continues to surge. We're back to an all-time record level of oil output in the United States, primarily, of course, driven by shale oil. Industrial production is up. Factory orders have been very strong in the second half of 2023. We all know about the cooldown in housing. Housing sales 
have dropped spectacularly. They're at levels we haven't seen since the, the, the wake of the Great Recession. But home prices are on their way up again. Home prices are starting to tick up. They're up, oh, about a percent, percent and a half year over year right now, which puts home prices back to an all-time high level. Even non-residential construction, I mentioned this, good solid numbers there. You can see on the right-hand side, industrial construction, manufacturing is way up. Most of that, by the way, is chip factories. Uh, good solid numbers. Even the stock market has been coming back. Debt markets remain remarkably clean. Uh, Bitcoin is coming back. That's how strong our economy is. Bitcoin's getting back to $40,000. Um, I'm often asked, is there a fundamental value to Bitcoin? There absolutely is. It's, uh, of course, zero. If you're wondering why, there's a great book I might suggest uh, about a, a, an interesting Italian-American gentleman, Charles Ponzi, lived about 100 years ago. Um, I have This is on my reading list. It's relatively new. I haven't picked it up yet. Uh, but I bought an extra copy, and I'm going to send it to this guy because I'm to understand he's going to have 10, 20 years to, to think about it, and he's going to have some time on his hand to read. So um, now, of course, what this brings me all to is a conversation I brought up in some of our past talks, but it's, it's worth discussing yet again. You know, as a PhD in, econo in economics, I, I was trained in the Chicago School of Thought, and at the bottom of that pile of, of mathematical formulas is a very important assumption, the idea of the rational agent, that People take into account what we call external metrics of reality information, and they proceed to make decisions on the basis of that. And that's a great starting place. It helps us understand a lot of things that people do. But when you look a little closer, and in particular, you look at some of our stories about the economy, you realize that this focus isn't always there. And I've noted before that what you really have to start with is this basic idea that social narratives and economic realities can in fact become offset from each other. And you know, a great example of where social narratives dominate economic reality is the fact that Bitcoin has a positive value. Um, it shouldn't, because look, I get it, there's a limited number of Bitcoins, but there's an infinite number of cryptocurrencies. Ergo, as an asset, this thing can't carry value for the long run, it just can't. But the stories told by the traders of, of cryptocurrencies, these, these myths and 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 stories and and rationalizations and it's all flowery and and it creates this atmosphere and in that atmosphere people can truly start to think that this thing has value so the story creates value out of thin air now the other side of that by the way might be where there's economic reality where there's not a natural social narrative and i talk about the federal deficit i mean i i know we talk about it. You hear about it. You've heard the numbers, 1.7 trillion. But to be clear, when we go to the voting booth next November, uh, how much do you think the federal deficit is really going to play a role in people's decision and who they vote for? And the answer is very little. Um, it's really not part of our narrative. It's not important to us. And that's one of the reasons why we're not tackling this issue, which is something I'm going to come down to at the very end of my presentation. And then I like to point out that there are, of course, things that do overlap. For example, Ticketmaster. We all know Ticketmaster's ripping us off. We do, right? Their fees are outrageous. It's unbelievable. Here, the social narrative and the economic reality is, is, is overlapping. But of course, it brings us to the third problem, which is even when the stars align and we're talking about the things that do truly matter, you still got to figure out what to do about it. So, of course, in this particular world, you start to recognize the narrative can come off base and you see narratives skewing our interpretations of economic news. Narratives at the root of economic bubbles. Narratives driving bad public policy. And again, Robert Schiller, we need to incorporate the contagion of narratives into our economic theory. Otherwise, we remain blind to a very real form of economic change. Or Will Rogers, of course, said it best. We've all been said before. It isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble. It's what we know that, well, just ain't so. So mm -hmm. words to live by. Now, the real issue, of course, in our world today, the primary thing holding back the U.S. economy is lack of labor. Now, a lot of this has to do with the overheated economy, but it also has to do with the fact that we really just don't have enough people. And yes, things have cooled off. You know, a year ago or so, there were two job openings for everybody looking for a job. It's now down to about 1.5. We're moving in the right direction. That's good news. Um, but we still don't have enough people. And by the way, it isn't because people aren't participating. On the right-hand side, this is participation rates for people in their prime working years, 25 to 54. They're at 20-year highs. People are working. They're taking these opportunities. This isn't the issue. <clears throat> and 
of course, this lack of labor means labor markets remain incredibly tight. Unemployment rates very, very low right now. Job openings rate high. Real wages continue to go up. The problem, of course, is the fact that we had just not been growing our potential labor force enough. Population growth has slowed tremendously. You can see the reasons why on the right-hand side, a big decline in birth rates, a slowdown in immigration uh, over the course of the last 20 years or so. All of this led to a situation where, you know, we used to add one and a half to two and a half million new workers every single year. And over the last decade, that's been running uh, around a million. So we just aren't adding enough people. And as a result of that, we're running out of, of course, people to fill critical job openings. Now, the wage impacts here are, are obvious. Lower skilled workers benefit tremendously from labor shortages. Indeed, if you take a look at the lower left-hand side here, this is earnings growth by quartile of earners. The highest quartile of earners has seen about a 27% increase in their nominal wages over the course of the last eight years. The lowest have seen 38%. So we're seeing income inequality falling in the United States. And you can see on the right-hand side, how those with less than a high school degree have seen, green, seen some of the greatest pace of earnings increase. Now, income inequality is still a big issue, but it is nice to see things moving in the right direction. <clears throat> the other side of that, of course, is the stress it puts on, of course, em employers. On the left-hand side, uh, big increases in labor costs, particularly for industries that use a substantial share of lower skilled, lower paid wake, uh, uh, labor, Accommodation, childcare, restaurants being top of the list. And there's also a lot more churn. <laughs> I think we've all felt that in our particular businesses where you just have a lot more turnover, people coming and going, much harder to, to keep productivity up, much harder to build that company culture. It is a problem, right? It's a problem of productivity, something we're all uh, dealing with. <laughs> now, if you look at, take a look at some of these primary markets that New Vision is in Alaska, Arizona, California, Washington, Wyoming, very similar sort of picture. Job openings rates remain quite elevated. Wyoming, <coughs> excuse me, uh, remains about, about 6%. It was 5.5%. Alaska is particularly profound. One of the highest job openings rates in the nation, still running about 8%. This is a state that desperately needs workers. A little better situation in, in California and Arizona and Wyoming, as the case may be. But again, on the right-hand side, you can see unemployment rates are down in all these places. And really, this is a function of, of labor force growth. You haven't had the same kind of labor force growth. In Alaska, it's actually down. Wyoming, it's down. This is the critical issue in these particular places. Washington, Arizona, a lot of immigration. These are places that are able to grow rapidly. And again, diving a little closer into the data, you can see unemployment rate for some of the major metropolises in these states. On the right-hand side, again, down to their pre-pandemic level. Who can add jobs is all a function of who has the available labor force. Phoenix, of course, top of the top of the top of the pop, so to speak. One decade, uh, thirty percent growth, but again, driven largely by labor force supply. Digging in just a little bit deeper, let's just think a little bit about where some of these economies in coming into the end of the year. Small selection here; we don't have too much time. Orange County, obviously, uh, where New Vision uh, tends to be headquartered, uh, most branches, as far as I can tell. Uh, you can see about thirty-six thousand jobs, two percent job growth in Orange County. Pretty good year overall. Very important professional business and services up about 1.8%. Important part of the local economy, construction doing well, leisure and hospitality bouncing back in the OC. Anchorage, also good steady numbers, about 2.7% growth in this metropolis up, getting close to 180,000 jobs again. But here it's a little bit more of a muddled picture. On the right far right side is location quotient. It gives you a sense of which jobs are most important in your local economy. Obviously natural resources in Alaska, a uh, big source of things. But that sector, of course, is having a tough time, uh, about 5% decline in jobs in this sector. However, other important sectors, logistics, up a little bit. Healthcare, up very strongly, government as well. But then you've looked farther down the list, some sectors that aren't typically uh, a big part of the, of the uh, Anchorage economy doing great. Financial activities, up 3.9%. Wholesale trade, up 2%. Other services, up 8%. Leisure and hospitality, of course, servicing, of course, tourism industry also seeing some growth. Going to Wyoming, interesting, again, sort of situation here. Logistics, very, very important, doing pretty well. So you see some of these key industries definitely starting to move ahead in, in, in some of these key markets. Good solid wage growth. You can see uh, on the left-hand side how uh, uh, weekly earnings for workers in these areas all continue to, uh, to go up. Orange County's cooled off just a bit, but of course the other economies, good solid. No, on the right-hand side, good solid growth, of course, in overall median household income. 
In Alaska, for example, up about 20%. Arizona up 32%. Very solid numbers there as well. And of course, a good growth rates means declining poverty rates. The less and less of smaller and smaller percent of the local economy that has a, a subprime credit score on the left-hand side. This is great news for credit unions, by the way, uh, in these areas. Uh, again, good solid numbers across the board. Looking ahead, of course, the big issue for most of these economies is really going to be where do we go from here? We don't have enough people. How do we grow? And of course, that's particularly profound in places which are seeing population declines, such as California, for example, which is actually seeing a uh, pretty substantial outbound migration. Well, well, first thing you need to do, of course, is figure out how to shift the population dynamics. For California, it's relatively straightforward. Of course, it has everything to do with simply building enough housing. For Wyoming and Alaska, different kind of more commodity-based states, Alaska in particular, that doesn't have, shall we say, the climate where what most people seem to be moving to, that is to say, southwestern kind of climate. Again, bit of a struggle there as well. These are states that have to think long and hard, but how do we yet again get people to understand that there's a great lifestyle to be had here in the state of Alaska, get people to understand there's great economic opportunities. It's got to be a big, a big, uh, a big part of local economic development, uh, dealing with these labor shortages. Now, with that being said, and I want to wrap up here before we get to, we can go into the next section in just a second, but here's a few thoughts to be thinking about. Again, increasing labor force, whether that's nationally immigration reform in California, it's a housing supply issue in Alaska, and maybe getting people to understand the kind of life they can enjoy if they were living in Alaska. If you can't get people to move there, second thing you can do is get more participation out of your existing population. Uh, how do we utilize our seniors more? There's a lot of seniors out there who would love an opportunity to continue to work uh, while, of course, enjoying their retirement. How do we work with those folks to create that possibility? Another big thing, of course, to be thinking about is women. The United States has a very low female participation rate relative to other developed economies. This, of course, is a function of our incredibly expensive unsubsidized childcare. This is a great time for local economies to be investing in some sort of sponsored, under, underwritten childcare to help these women continue their careers, even while they're building families. Productivity enhancements, worker skill training, getting people to be able to move into those occupations really short supply. This is particularly profound in the healthcare industry. A lot of skilled, well-paying occupations that need a two-year certificate. So again, how do we work with our community colleges, get people into these programs? We know this is great for them. There's also, of course, capital improvements, AI. We've all heard about AI. Uh, between you and me, I think AI and chat engines, that's a bunch of hooey. It's flash. It's a Flash in the pan, it's going to go away, it's going to be silliness. But where artificial intelligence can play a huge role is in those kind of sophisticated enterprises that have needed humans, but now can use our AI to do sophisticated uh, tasks. For example, here in California, can we use AI to pick strawberries? This is something that only people can do. Can, AI, can an AI train machine learn how to pick strawberries? Again, alleviating of course, some of those labor shortages. Now, here, you always have these big pushbacks. A lot of people want to, of course, push back against technological change. They're afraid of disruption. But in a world of labor force shortages, we have to lean on these new technologies. And that means the most important thing of all is we have to have adaptive workers. And this is a conversation we have to have with our kids. How do we teach anti-fragility? How do we make sure our kids understand that the only constant in life is change, and your best education can be learned to, to how to adapt with that particular change. So I'm gonna break there. This is a good time for a little Q&A before we go ahead and get into the meat of the presentation, which is what the heck's gonna happen in 2024. Um, well, that's so a, yeah, a great, great news. Several yeah. labor. <laughs> love it. Yeah, I love it. And I, I'm <laughs> interested uh, to hear about your thoughts about as we go into 2024. We, you know, we did receive a few questions. Let me just uh, take a little bit of time. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so I haven't uh, tried to uh, paraphrase these a little bit since. So since we experienced, and this is coming from a, a, a member, uh, since we experienced real inflation above 5% in 2023, if we deduct that from a 3% GDP, I think you referenced that you know, in one of your slides earlier, has not the economy actually shrunk in real terms? Okay, a couple of things I want to take on here. First of all, Actually, year over year, 
Inflation for consumers is down to about three and a half percent right now, three and a half, four percent. So actually like in, in Q in Q3 or or even in oh, Q4. Just year over year. Yeah. If you if you okay, look, I, I showed you those graphs a little while ago. If you look at overall yeah. year over year change in consumer prices, it is it has dropped below four percent. It's in the low mid th threes right now, year over year. And by the way, the October number was completely flat. September to October prices didn't change. So Inflation is cooling off. Now, with that being said, the GDP numbers I gave you were real. Those were already inflation adjusted. So my GDP output numbers already accounted for changes in prices. That's the real deal. 3% real growth in output. Um, the GDP deflator year over year is about 4%. So that means if we looked at nominal GDP up about 7%. That's, I think that's helpful. And hopefully the member who asked this, uh, it yeah. seems like you know, that's on target. Another question, um, how much of, of spending, I think we're talking about consumer spending here, has come from increased credit card you know, debt? You know, We have seen those levels go up, at least in terms of like actual dollar amount terms yeah. anyway. Yeah. And, and, and a follow on to that is, you know, for this member is how long can that really last? Right. Great questions that I'm going to address. In part two. <laughs> okay, so we'll hold off on that one. Another yeah. one, I know we've we've talked a little bit about this, I think, uh, at least the general topic of commercial real estate in some of our other uh, conversations earlier in the year. Uh, this member brings up a commercial real estate values in Los Angeles have dropped by 60% for large office high rises. So I know some particular, at least what I've learned, there's a lot of specifics when it comes to commercial real estate in terms of the yeah. particular. So they're referencing large office high rise in terms of the reference to the drop in value by about 60%. Does that have any residual impact that concerns you, Chris? Um, well, first of all, the numbers haven't dropped that dramatically, right? There's no doubt prices are down. Um, 60 percent, probably not that much. They've dropped, but not not that not that quite that spectacularly. Um, with that being said, the real question here is 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 that does that going to have a drag on the economy? Um, <clears throat> yes, in as much as you have um, you're going to have continue to have some what I would call financial disruption for the industries wrapped around these sort of, of, of um, negotiations, right? We understand that over the last decade, a lot of office buildings have had financial managers just leveraging up like nobody's business. Every, every inch of leverage that could be used was used. Unfortunately, when you have this kind of disruption, suddenly you find yourself with negative equity. Now, the owners still need to operate the building. The bank knows that. And so the com comfortable conversations we're having right now is largely boils down to this. Hey, Mr. Lender, would you like a building or would you like to take a haircut? <laughs> now, <clears throat> the good news is that isn't having broader economic impacts. It's not having an impact on credit availability. It's not having an impact on, on banks. You're not creating the secondary disruptions. You don't see frozen pipelines. In other words, you're not seeing any of those real issues having to do with credit flows that we saw in the wake of the Great Recession. And of course, underlying that is consumers, a very strong consumer. That's going to be our next section. Um, and of course, with a strong consumer, most of this stuff is just water under the bridge. We'll get through it. It's not going to be, uh, what's the term? Systemic, I think is the term they use. It's not going to be systemic. Right. Although it could be, I think, as you're saying, if, if I follow you, there could be some markets where it's more emphasized or, you know, than than others, you know, depending on, again, specific circumstances. But you're talking about kind of across the across the, the U.S. economy. Right, right? Yeah. Correct? Yeah. And and to be clear, it's the big commodity markets that that are having the, the big impact. What's interesting is even the secondary markets aren't even seeing a big problem. Vacancy rates in, in, in Reno are down. Tucson, they're down. Vacancy rates in Vegas are down. By the way, not a secondary market. Office rate, vacancy rates in Phoenix are down. So actually, in a lot of markets, vacancy rates for office space are declining, not going up. Um, it's the big commodity spaces, like, for example, the Bay Area. The Bay Area is in a tough shape on this particular front and not a big surprise. Yes, tech workers are less likely to go back to the office, which means a bigger uh, shrinkage in demand. But let's go to the next step on that. Um, San Jose built expanded its office stock by 40% in the last decade. From 2013 to 2023, they expanded their office stock 
by 40%. By the way, their housing stock went up by about 4%. So when you expand your housing stock by 4%, your office space by 40%, you were kind of heading for a problem anyway, weren't you? Right? Yeah. Wow. That's now, that's proportions. I didn't realize the office it, it space increase was that high. Oh, You're saying yeah. the actual, like the space available went from, went up by 40%. Is that yeah. right? Well, well, think of the mega campuses. Look at the Google campus. Yeah. Look at the Apple campus. Yeah. Look at millions of square feet those things are. They count, right? So yeah. and you have that big issue. But here's the key. For all that being said, the unemployment rate in San Jose and San Francisco is 3%. That's yeah. the number you need to focus on. And one, and I think this might be the uh, someone who is referring to. I'm, I'm not, maybe you'll make more sense. I'm not sure if I fully understand that. There, there was a, a comment that I think maybe is referencing back to an earlier statement you made, Chris. It says, "Aren't you comparing to a higher or a high inflation rate last year?" And you may have even already covered that. I just noticed this question in earlier, so um, I just wanted to share it in case. Well, again. Um... The pace of inflation I'm talking about is just the year-over-year -year growth rate. We used that a, a few slides ago. In fact, let me see if I can just pull Since we seem to be a lot of confusion on that, let me go and pull it up. Um, yeah, there it is on the right-hand side. So again, um, if you go back to, say, uh, uh, the overall PC is the gray line there, and you can see it, it peaked in mid-2022 at about 7% year-over-year and it's now down to just about 3% year over year. So it's it's the the pace of inflation. The prices are not going to fall, folks. I mean, that that's something that that is, I think, often suggested that somehow or other, the end of inflation means prices are going to go back down. They're not. The ebb in inflation is when prices start rising, and that's what's happening right now. Prices are, are not rising anymore. Right. I do think, and I don't know, I mean, you don't have to go into it now, but I mean, they're not maybe rising or at least not as much, but that, but back to, they did go up to a particular level you, that, that depending on kind of the component, yeah, pr we're pretty high and they're staying there and yeah. they're just not yeah. going up as much. That doesn't mean relative to say a couple of years ago, you know, the, the, you know, our members, general consumers aren't feeling the, the, the pinch in terms of the, the, um, the costs. Would well, that be well, a fair they, they have. There's, there's little doubt about it, but don't forget that that pinch came from excessive consumer demand, and that came yes. from all the cash that was throughout the economy, which is, of course, the next session. In fact, why don't we do that? Why don't we jump into the next section? Well, hey, can I throw in one question? Oh, just please, that you know, means. you got because yeah. my, you know, I've got four daughters and a son, and 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 so you'll understand where I'm coming from. In this you mentioned yeah. Live Nation and Ticketmaster. Yeah. So where my mind went was the the Taylor. You know, swift effect on the oh, yeah. economy. I've been hearing about that there's literally some impact, at least in local economy, where she has concert. Is that actually a real thing, or is that one of those uh, media narratives? Well, let, let, let me go to the next step. Um, okay, it is the real thing, and I say that in as much as my company, along with my forecasting, some of the talking I do. You know, I have twenty people, and we do impact studies, and one of our clients is Live Nation. So we do impact studies for some of these events. They are the real deal. They absolutely do bring them in. Now, Taylor Swift, she packs a stadium full of people. A lot of those people are spending a lot of money while they're there. They're coming from all over the place. They're spending money on hotels. Um, Yeah, that's a big impact. That's a good, you know, having Taylor Swift come to town is, you know, maybe not quite as good as having the Super Bowl, but it's probably closer than you think. Yeah. <laughs> You know, well, thank you. I've, I've at least made my kids happy uh, that I asked that question. <laughs> and Roger, I mean, you got all think watching, from but I'll tell them. Right? I, I'll tell them I brought Taylor Swift out. They'll be happy. There so, uh, well, shall we go on to uh, part two? Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to start out with part two, by the way, by talking a little bit about psychology again, right? Which is, how do these narratives so go, go so astray? Because you know, what's funny is, is a lot of the questions I'm hearing you ask about, like about inflation and stuff like that, I hear people responding to concerns often raised in the papers and I'm giving them information which pushes back and they're like, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And that that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say that our narratives are off base from the realities. I understand people feel like, wow, inflation has been a big deal. But then when you look at what people are actually doing, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal, at least not in the aggregate. We always know they're winners and losers. But then the question is, is then how do we have this opinion of inflation. And it all boils down to the idea about how humans think. 
Another great book, Daniel Kahneman wrote this wonderful book years and years ago called, well, maybe a decade ago, Thinking Fast and Slow. Just to give you a little sense of this guy, he's he's a he's an academic, PhD academic who does psychology, who's won the Nobel Prize in economics. That is how profoundly smart this human being is. I mean, this guy's off the charts. But it's, this book can be summed up very simply, the people have two ways of thinking. We have type one and we have type two. And and our type our type two thinking is our human thinking. It's the rational thinking. It's our that that's that's the part of our brain that allows us to figure out our taxes and you know what makes what what an atom is made out of, right? Quarks and all this kind of stuff. This is that brain. Problem with type two is it's expensive. We all know that thinking hard takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. No one has the capacity to study everything like this. So way more often than we like, we actually rely on our type one system. And our type one system, that's our old system. It's it's fast, it's instinctive, it's emotional, it's quick, it's efficient. This is your this is your cat brain, right? <laughs> and the thing about this system is as efficient as it is, it's full of biases. And all these biases, I'm not even gonna go through this, there's millions of biases that this system is afflicted by. And the way to think of a cognitive bias, I like to use a visual bias. And, and Roger, I'm gonna need your help on this one. So I'm glad you're not, you're not actually on mute. Um, here's my question for you. You see those horizontal lines? Are they parallel? They don't look at, well, actually, but, but they, do look at, they do look at, actually, <laughs> no, they, they are, because they're angled the same, <laughs> but I don't know if that's right. But, but, but no, but see, this is it. What you're struggling with is your type one and your type two brain are fighting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Type two is saying they're horizontal, they're parallel because he's asking me this question. Your type two brain is in front of me. It's it's deducing where, where am I going with this, and your type one brain is. It going, is. I'm like, well, well, is the top, but not the bottom ones. You know, is it a yeah. trick question? But they're parallel. Now again, yeah. this is a visual cognitive bias, but it's the same idea. So we're we if when we're using our type one system, the world gets warped in very specific ways, and that of course causes us to view events, to view the world in distinctly biased ways. And a great, another great book, and too many books this time, but again, it's Christmas. Go get these on your reading list. Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. He goes through all of this stuff and in particular, he talks a lot about our moral nodes and how our, what he, what he says in this book is he says that, that we like to, th we, he thinks of a human being as like a rider and the elephant. Our type two brain is the rider. Our type one brain is the elephant. And we like to think that type two is in control. It's not. Oh, the elephant will listen. But when the elephant wants to do something else, you're kind of along for the ride, chief. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when you live in this world, of course, where everything is negative, 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 it's your type, your elephant gets stressed out and it starts over responding to everything. And that's been the narrative in the last decade. And since the Great Recession came to an end, every single headline is telling us how terrible and tragic everything is. No one's getting a raise. Everybody's falling behind. Our kids have a terrible standard of living. I mean, just take that. Millennials have a poor standard of living than, than, than their parents will, right? Just think of that. It doesn't make any sense. Just look at how kids live their lives. How can we say that? Yet, when you say it over and over, it starts to have an impact. Miserableism, the philosophy. Now, the reality of kids today, by the way, is they're doing fine. Take a look on our real earnings by age on the left-hand side. <laughs> no matter how much, how old you are, you're, you're making you're making more money. On the right hand side, this is real earnings. I love this. Take a look at what a, what a twenty five to thirty four year old makes today forty six thousand on average. Look in the far right column. People like you and me, Roger, when we were twenty five to thirty four, we were making thirty two thousand dollars a year. So actually, kids today are making a hell of a lot more than we are. And oh, but they're all drowning in debt. Not really. Take a look on the lower right hand side. This is real net worth by age. Actually, we just got the twenty twenty two data. 35 to 44 year olds today have the highest real net worth that they've that anybody in that age has ever had. So no, kids today are not falling behind. And by the way, how about all the things that aren't in the data? Well, we, we live longer. We have fewer infant mortalities. Yes, we have more mass shootings, but every other form of crime is down. We have more people with college degrees and it's not even there. Uh, hey, this is a cell phone today. Roger, hey, 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 this is a cell, remember the cell phone when you and I were kids? <laughs> Right. Or or a car today versus a car when we were kids, uh, a TV when we were kids. 
this is a TV today with a million things to watch on it, right? Um, I mean, even even dieting. This is what dieting used to be. Now you take a pill. You don't have to diet anymore. Now, with all this being said, look at the data. Mental health problems are up. Suicides up. Girls visiting teenage girls visiting emergency rooms surging. It's a weird world because we are upset. We can see the problems, yet you look at the data, they don't exist. This, for me, is the scary part of what's going on around us. These narratives have profound impacts. And you see this in policy. <clears throat> How do we get in this place in the first place? Well, it was all these crazy headlines about the pandemic. It was going to cause a depression. It never was. In fact, it was a deep recession, but it was the shortest recession we ever had. Complete recovery in a year and a half. The Great Recession was six quarters just to hit bottom, seven years to recover. This was nothing, yet we still talk about it as this huge issue. And of course, in response to the $1.2 trillion in actual lost income, $6 trillion in stimulus, $50,000 for every household, that's what we got, $50,000 for every household. Now, when you throw all that money at the economy, you have inflation. You expanded the money supply by 35%. Inflation is what happens. It's just how it is. We know that. Too much demand causes prices to go up. But look at the narratives. This was, a, this was something that came out at the end of last year. 85% of Americans are feeling impact of inflation day-to-day -day lives. Second, third bullet. I'm sorry, second bullet. 88% said inflation has impacted their spending in restaurants. Roger, 38% increase in restaurant spending. <laughs> yeah. This is a standard me. The restaurants, I feel like the restaurants, I they're more challenged just to have enough staffing to yeah. serve the crowds. Well, and by the way, <clears throat> to your point, I mean, restaurants don't feel like they're getting ahead of the game because every dollar that comes in goes out the back, right? And the yeah. front goes out the yeah. back. I get it. Yeah. <clears throat> but again, people are spending money. We see it. You know, this TikToker says, oh, the older generations don't know about inflation. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Look at the 1970s. But it's not just the amateurs. This is from The Economist magazine. The Economist. This should be a wealth of reasonable reasonableness, right? And this is a recent article. Could the inflation nightmare soon be over? Nightmare? Well, what are they talking about? But yet again, it's amazing how we talk about this stuff. Now, the reality was consumers haven't been impacted by inflation because it's consumers driving inflation. Now, I understand, and it seems odd. Well, where's the income problem? I mean, real incomes have been hit by inflation. Real you know, household savings rates are going down. Aren't they running out of the money they were given? But this is wealth. You know, we have this big feedback effect. All that money hit the economy. Asset markets took off. Asset markets haven't capitulated. People still have $35 trillion more in net worth today than they did prior to the pandemic. Well, at least they think they did. That's a 32% increase. And by the way, the bottom 50% saw the bigger increase than anyone else. It's wealth. <clears throat> How about wealth in the form of cash on hand? Prior to the pandemic, all American households had a trillion dollars. Americans today have $4 trillion cash on hand. And yes, behind all this money is consumer credit. You personally asked that question a few seconds ago. We are seeing growth. We're seeing growth in the use of credit card debt, growth in the use of HELOCs, of course. This is how you use your wealth when you don't want to sell your asset. And there's no surprise to be borrowing money against your assets when it's this high. The question is, is it dangerous? And the answer is no. The credit card thing just bemuses me to know that. A couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, credit card debt went over a trillion dollars. And you would have thought it was the end of the world. Uh, are, are you familiar with the, I'm talking to you, Roger, because you're with me here today. Um, yeah. Are you familiar with this is Spinal Tap? With with what? Say it again. Movie, this is Spinal Tap. No. Oh, okay. Never mind. Not, it, there's a, a famous segment in there where this old adult rock and roll star is bragging about no. how the fire goes to eleven. But yeah, I, I thought you were going to talk about that movie that I haven't watched yet. But I watched the preview, Dumb Money. That oh. you know, talks, you know that about running up the stock of GameStop and all that. Anyway, oh yeah, different, that, different topic. Fun. Different topic. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the key. A trillion dollars in credit card debt doesn't mean anything. You have to know credit card debt relative to people's income. Well, prior to the Great Recession, credit card debt was 8% of disposable income. After the Great Recession, you can see this on the left-hand side, it was 
During the pandemic, it dropped to 4%. And for all the increases in credit card debt, it just got above 5% right now. HELOC debt, by the way, again, in the run-up to the Great Recession, HELOCs were 6% of income. Today, they're less than 2%. So no, consumer debt is still low from any medium-term perspective. And if you look on the right-hand side, there's a little hike in delinquency rates for credit cards, but a hike to levels we were normally at in 2003. To me, none of this looks dangerous. It could get dangerous. It absolutely could. A couple of years of this, could we get into the red zone? We could. This is the beauty of my job. You have to keep inviting me back to find out when it becomes dangerous. Right now, not an issue. Now, again, all these weird inflation narratives, but the weirdest one of all has to be the one the Federal Reserve is using. And that is that inflation is being driven not by excessive money, but by inflation expectations. And this is Jerome Powell's own quote on this. If the public expects inflation to remain low and stable over time, then absent major shocks, it will. Unfortunately, the same is true with high inflation. Now, I, there's no logic to this whatsoever. That's not how price levels work. It's not imagined. It doesn't say, you know, but this is their view. And, and this is the bigger problem we have. I talked about this last time. <laughs> According to the Federal Reserve, the U.S. inflation was started by an exogenous shock is now being driven by expectations. And according to them, it's been terrible for American households. Ergo, they got to fight inflation, even if they cause a recession. And you have quotes like this. We have to get this under control. We have to get it to 2%. None of this makes any sense to me. Now, of course, inflation is slowing down because the economy is catching up to all that new money they printed. And it's going to fade away on its own, but not that quickly and certainly not quickly enough for the Fed. So the Fed, of course, continues its quantitative tightening efforts. Now, here's a little mystery. You know, federal funds rates have stopped. Quantitative tightening continues, but suddenly deposits in the banking system are stabilized. I'm not sure where the banks are getting extra money, if they're getting it from some backdoor repo operations with the Federal Reserve, or perhaps cash is coming in from the rest of the world. But for whatever reason, deposits have stabilized the American banking system. And my big fear, as we talked about last time, interest rates continuing to rise. Well, they are higher. I think they're going to be higher longer, but they've cooled off a bit. 30 years coming down just a little bit. Two years cooling off, 10 years cooling off, they're not going to drop. They're going to continue to, to be in this range for a while, is, is my belief. But looks like the pressure is coming off a bit. And by the way, we got our senior loan officer survey for the third quarter. And actually, standards are getting a little looser and rates are coming down. So even some of the credit pressures we're seeing are actually loosening on the economy. Good news. So consumer demand is going to be fine. Credit seems to be continuing to flow. Still a little garbled, don't get me wrong, but it's not getting worse. Um, but what about housing? You know, this, of course, again, brings me back to some of these narratives we're hearing about. And, you know, I can already hear some grumbling Gen Z out there going, oh, sure, okay, so maybe we're doing okay on, on income and maybe we're doing okay on, on our Hulu, um, but we'll never be able to buy a house. And, and I love, this is another one of those memes. Uh, they have the 1980s, the 2020s house out there. And you know, make some calculations. And you could hear the OK Boomer going on here. You know, back then, $16,000 uh, down payment, $30,000 salary, 50% of an annual wage. Nowadays, $80,000 down payment, $50,000 salary. OK, Boomer, you get it now? Now, there's a few problems here. First of all, his numbers are all wrong. Incomes aren't that high today, and the price of homes isn't that high. Um, but there's a bigger issue here, which is, of course, he didn't account for interest rates which is really the critical issue here. In fact, if you account for interest rates, actually there isn't all that much of a difference between housing costs today and housing costs back then. Housing isn't all that expensive. And then I like to point out, you know, he's got these comparisons of this new house and this old house on here. And again, remember that quality of life thing? Take a look at these houses. The one on the right is clearly better. It's got a garage for God's sake. The one on the left doesn't have one. It's got a nice second story on it. Right. Nice, clean siding, not the old crappy stuff. And the worst part of the place on the left, do you see those two things on the kid on the stoop? you got a few of those yourself, Rod. Do you know how much those things cost? You probably do, don't you? Terrible thing to have in a house. <laughs> Makes it very unaffordable. <laughs> now, again, you've heard all this stuff, how unaffordable it is. Here's a dirty little secret. <laughs> For anybody who didn't buy a house in the last decade, shame on you. Because you just went through a decade of the cheapest housing this nation has ever seen once you account for interest rates. Now, there's no doubt. You can see this is 
This is housing affordability. I'm calling, talking about the cost of carrying a house relative to people's income. Look how low it was. Now it has surged because of the hike in interest rates. This is exactly why, of course, sales have gone down. But again, the degree of unaffordability, we're kind of back to where we were in 1986, 1987. When did you buy your first house, Roger? I think, I'm trying to remember, I think we bought around, let me think about this, 92. Okay. I think that's when we got into our first so house. A little cheaper, a little cheaper than it is right yeah. now. A little cheaper yeah. than it is right now. Yeah. Now, of course, prices have not fallen despite the increase in interest rates. Um, remember, they went up a lot because of the you know 2%, 7%, this big ricochet, crazy whiplash, but they're not going down. And this is the problem. The reason we have unaffordable housing is because interest rates went up a lot and home prices will not capitulate. And they won't capitulate because, again, there's no reason for their people to capitulate. A lot of people are locked in at a sub 3% mortgage. They're not going anywhere. Tons of equity, financial obligations are low. This is a very stable housing market. Prices aren't going to come down. So housing will be unaffordable for a couple of years, but it's a short run circumstance until everything kind of re-equilibriates. The bigger issue, of course, is the lack of supply. We've talked about this in the past. There's simply not enough homes. We haven't been building enough, which is one of the reasons why, by the way, the housing market continues to build units, despite the fact that there's no sales. New home sales are the highest share of overall housing sales we've ever seen. And even then, vacancy rates continue to be at an ultra low level. By the way, this is good for growth over the next year or two. We know that construction industry will continue to be pumping out housing units just to deal with the sheer shortage. Now, if you look around some of these markets, California, Alaska, Arizona, Washington, yet again, you can see there's very few sales are way down. Our prices have indeed stabilized. They're starting to come up. Uh, California prices are up. Washington are up. Arizona, they're up. Um, Alaska, they're, they're, they're relatively stable. The biggest issue very few units for sale. The housing inventory, months of supply, incredibly tight. This is not a buyer's market. Uh, my suggestion to anybody thinking about buying a house, wait. Just wait. Um, the only reason you, you should buy a house is if you're about three months from your first kid, buy a house. Um, or obviously, there are conditions where you have to move. Or you have to, you're going to have to change locations. You're changing jobs. You're, you're, you're military uh base you got to transfer to a new military base in these kind of circumstances you got to do it my suggestion buy small right you know i know the real estate agent is going to tell you oh you know you marry the house and yeah 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 do you date the mortgage nah, don't do it yourself don't be house poor it's a miserable condition to be in don't expect for interest rates to come down buy something small you can afford stay stay well within your lane and in a few years you'll be able to sell that and buy something else and that time you'll be able to afford it and get something much nicer. As for apartments, they continue to remain very tight. Rents are up, uh, not falling. Vacancy rates still remain tight. It's not affordability. If you take a look, of course, at the share of, of, of rent or cost burden households, it, it really hasn't changed much in the last five years. The numbers are, are, are reasonable relative to what we were back in 2017. It's not affordability. It's all about housing permits. And on this front, Again, the best you could say, it hasn't gotten any worse, but for some of these places, particularly say, for example, for California, it's not getting much better either. Now, the weirdness in all this thing, let's go through what we said, right? The Fed is tightening, but credit markets seem to be stabilized. That's good news. Consumer, lots of gas left in the tank. Housing will continue to contribute to the economy, even if it looks very, very unaffordable. Where is the downside? Well, of course, that has to do with the federal government itself. And to be clear, while the Fed has been trying to cool things off, uh, uh, the, the Congress has been trying to heat it up, right? We, with this $1.7 trillion deficit this year, another $100 billion they're negotiating right now. A lot of that money is being spent on Ukraine and Israel. This is a spending issue. You can see on the right-hand side, look at that huge increase in federal spending. It's amazing to me. Current receipts, these are taxes the government get, takes into account. Current receipts have been running between 16 and 20% for a very long time. But it's really on the spending side. It used to be, you know, if you go back to 2005, it was running 20%. Now it's 24%, vastly above revenues. We have a real problem here. And of course, with Social Security and Medicare out there in front of us, it's just going to get worse. We need to get in front of this. Now, you don't want to, I don't want to necessarily panic anybody, but it's it's there's this whole secondary background thing that we all have to pay attention to, which is the idea as interest rates start to come up, 
you're going to have a higher cost of carrying the existing debt. Year and a half ago, about a half a billion a year. This year, we just the year we just finished, about 760 billion. The year in right now, we'll probably hit a trillion in interest expenses. Next year, it'll probably be 1.2, 1.25 trillion. So under that sort of, of circumstance, the deficits, the debt is going to get grow all by itself just on the cost of carrying the existing debt. This is a big issue. They need to get in front of it. Now, is it the end of the world? Can we not do this? Take a look at the right-hand side. We came out of World War II with federal debt at 120% debt to GDP. And within one decade, it was down to 50%. We can deal with this. It's very simple. You need to cut back on spending and increase re revenues. You have to hike some taxes, get a cut some spending. It'll be fine. The problem is we can't do that. Why can't we do it? Miserableism, catastrophism. You talk about raising a tax the tiniest bit, people lose their minds. You talk about cutting spending just a little bit, people lose their minds. We have no proportionality. Everything is a cliff edge. Everything is chaos. Everything's the end is nigh. And in that kind of world, we can't make basic decisions about compromise and making a, a steady path forward. We don't have a debt problem. We have a debt narrative problem. And that's something we all have to keep in mind. It's our conversation about the deficit that's the problem, not the deficit itself. And of course, well, guess what? Now we're starting to see rating decline. Now, <clears throat> could this thing really truly blow up? For me, the biggest issue is asset prices, which haven't capitulated. Could they? We'll see. This one you got to pay attention to. I'm thinking financial markets are, are reset to this new level. They'll probably keep chugging forward. But this, this is where you need to pay, pay attention. So are we out of the woods? That's been the big question. The answer is we were never in the woods. It's as simple as that. We were never going to have a recession. No, the Federal Reserve isn't engineering a soft landing because there was never going to be a hard one. Um, and looking to 24, the economy's fine. Yeah, it's going to slow down a little bit. But household finances, consumer demand, housing, everything's right. Everything says the economy continues to grow. But headwinds will intensify. You're going to see, of course, inflation staying above target. The Fed's going to continue to tighten. Well, credit tightness isn't getting worse. It's not getting much better either. So something we got to pay attention to. Deficits are unsustainable. Asset prices are still too high. But again, no recession. Not in the cards. Not seeing it. Just cooling off from that 5% growth rate we saw in the third quarter. Our biggest issue, of course, narratives. It's labor supply, not consumer demand. Inflation is not a problem. The Fed is. And government deficits will, at some point in time, have to be dealt with. Now, our outlook for the next year, we see interest rates roughly being where they are right now. 10-year Treasury, 5.5%. Mortgage rate, maybe low eights. But this is it. They're going to be down towards the end of next year and down into 2025. We're looking at growth rates substantially 3%, little, but a little less than 3% this year. They think it's going to drop below 2% this next year, but labor markets will remain tight. Housing market will remain nice and strong. We think home prices are going to stay steady as well. But the big issue is those narratives. And this brings us back to, of course, this national case of Munchausen syndrome we all have right now. You know, Munchausen, that syndrome, that's where you're constantly having to try, you're trying to commit your doctor to something wrong with you. <laughs> Well, that's what we're doing. We're constantly trying to invent problems because we don't seem to have enough real ones for us to be focusing on. And it's frustrating. We can't seem to get out of this cycle. Why? Well, there's a whole other part of this, which I think is important. The last little bit about the psychology of this stuff. Jonathan Knight said it best when he says, the big issue here is people can believe pretty much whatever they want to believe about moral and political issues as long as some other people near them believe it. And what he's really talking about the fact that there's another role the narrative plays and that is, of course, having to do not so much with our elephant and our emotions, but as a form of social bonding. You know, when you think about why humans are so spectacularly co co cooperative relative to, you know, some of our cousins running around on the the the, the canopy of the um, of the rainforests, um, you, you're talking about a situation where we have shared beliefs. And you can think about those shared beliefs as, you know, the ancient Egyptians praying together to Ra, the sun god, or indeed a bunch of UCLA uh, students praying to their particular god to beat SC this particular year, which they did, by the way. Um, it's the same concept. 
And when those narratives become enrooted in a social construct, well, now it's really hard to change them. And, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, I live in California. This is a state that's well known to be left. And what's interesting is you think when I bring them information that shows the income inequality is falling, you'd think these people would be the happiest to hear that particular news. And they're not. They get upset by it. And that, to me, is one of the oddest circumstances that what is happening is what they want to happen, but somehow or other they reject that. And that, of course, goes to the idea that income inequality has become a fundamental social bonding narrative within, of course, the folks that run our state. And for them, it's not telling them what they want to hear. It's threatening that social structure. And that, of course, is how, why it's so hard to change a narrative. It is easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. For example, I think I mentioned this before, but Mark Twain never actually said that. <laughs> but it's a meme, so now everybody thinks he did. As always, go out and avoid those weapons of mass distraction. Ignore the screaming headlines. Things are pretty darn good out there. The biggest problem is the fact that we don't seem able to recognize that things are pretty darn good. And with that, thank you all very much for your time today. And uh, Roger, uh, I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Yeah, we'll see if we have uh, uh, any more questions. You know, one thing, Chris, and I may have just missed it in your deck, but I know often we get questions on this and I think about it. Did you have a viewpoint on rates, on interest rates? Did I miss that? In, in terms of <laughs> yeah, at the very end of my forecast. Yeah. Oh, the, that, oh, oh, on the on the on the treasury, like the tre did yeah, you have a, a, a did you have a viewpoint on short term rates, you know, and what the Fed would do? Because that gets talked about a lot. You know, did you have a viewpoint on that? Yeah, the Fed isn't going to back off. <laughs> not not okay. going to be being alive. You think they're going to keep the short term rates higher for for all of 2020? Because I think much of the equity market a analysts are pricing pricing some cuts in. Yeah. Um, so. And 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 to be clear, they have been. Uh, Every forecast I have seen for interest rates in the last two years have them falling next month. <laughs> yeah, they have it. They keep going. Well, up. and I, you know, I, 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 I mentioned I mentioned at one of your slides, and I, 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 I this I paused it this earlier. Now that I remember, I think you have the ten year around five and a half for twenty twenty four, but yet at the moment it's uh, you know in the low fours. I think. So, are you thinking the ten year is actually going to? going to advance from where it is today? Uh, I, uh, yeah. I mean, we're actually, to be honest with you, you caught me mid forecast. We're actually doing our forecast okay. right now and we are starting okay. to pull up numbers. I, I got to the end. I went, Oh, I probably. So, so uh, is this another, we got to invite you back to get the full, the full exactly. answer. Is that, is that where you're going? Okay. <laughs> Here's what I'm thinking. I'm honestly thinking, and I think treasuries, I, I would, I would guess the 10 year is going to get in the low fives middle, beginning of next year. I think we're in a little bit of a swoon. I think it's going to bounce back a little bit. I can't, Imagine all this cash going to continue to come online. The dollar is starting to fall, which also would suggest some outflow of capital is possible. That will push interest rates up a little bit as well. With that being said, I do think they'll peak in the first quarter of next year, maybe the second quarter, and start slowly coming back down. And my guess is the interest rate regime, as well as the potential for buying a house, will look substantially better in 2025 than it did in 2024. That's it. That's helpful. You know, yeah. and something that came up earlier, I don't recall if you, I think I just missed it earlier. So I don't know at what point uh, it was submitted. Uh, there was a question relative to uh, foreclosures. I'm not sure if it was residential or commercial or both. There, there are, and there whether are, or not, you kind of where you see that trend for next year. Yeah, not nowhere. I mean, if you're if you're in the Rio, REO market, forget about it. There's not, no one's going to be getting foreclosed on. Prices aren't going to fall. There's very little debt out there. That's not going to happen. And even in the commercial world, you know, you go to default when you have no other options. And people didn't have options in that world because things were so ugly across the board. Everybody was fighting for their, their very lives. Um, this time around, I think, you know, it's funny. I have a, a very good friend of mine who's in the commercial real estate world. He dealt, works on contracts and he's been very bored. <laughs> and and I, I saw I talked to him the other day. I go, how's it going? He goes, I'm busy. And I go, Why? He goes, it's finally, people are finally going, okay, it's happening. We're just going to have to deal with it. And he said, it, it's not panicked. They're just, they're going through what they need to do. The economy's fine. 
you'll, you'll be able to do this in, in negotiations and, and, and they'll sort it out. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be 2008, 2009, 2010. It's just not in the cards. Well, great. Well, Chris, these are great, uh, great insights. I really appreciate uh, your time. I, I, a couple things as we close out, um, you know, your time and insights are just fantastic. And I think it's just, you know, helpful to hear. I know you talk to different economists, you know, back to media narrative and just different point of views. Chris is one perspective, but I, but I think it's one worth weighing. Uh, you certainly listen to other folks too and weigh them. But I, I really think you've got some great information to share and something that many of our members wouldn't necessarily be reading in their in their common, uh, you know, uh, kind of media sources, I, I suspect. So I think it's and, nice to provide multiple perspectives such as you're doing. And you have to pay attention there. Look, if you want to you want to be a good forecaster. You have to know the data and you have to know the narrative. Right. So you do have to pay attention. But I would just caution people. I've been right. Just keep that in mind when you're looking at other people's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I do maybe a couple. Uh, no, you know, no, there's a share. couple logistic things I can cover. Um, but what maybe a last one I'll take that just came in. I noticed, um, you know, somebody was saying that supposedly there's a you know trillions of dollars on consumer balance sheet and cash or money market. Do you think that would drive higher stock market valuations, or you know, you, you, because of that kind of putting that money to work? Uh, well, no, I mean, the money is already being put to work, right? Those money market funds are a critical element of our financial system. It allows for a lot of short-term lending windows. The banking system is often very critically dependent on those money flows. So that's there. It's alive and well. I, I, I think it's perfectly healthy. The question about the stock market, I think, is, is a little bit different. Look, I, I don't like the stock market right now. I think it's overvalued. I think the PE ratios are outrageous given where interest rates are. At some point in time, they're going to have to factor in these higher carrying costs. Corporate profits, by the way, are starting to swoon a bit. What's interesting is in the last three quarters, we've seen a shift in income, national income, away from the corporations towards workers. So again, those labor shortages are starting to dig into corporate profits. And I think there has got to be some capitulation somewhere in that asset market. But, uh, you know, which stocks take the big hit? When does it occur? Yeah. I'm going to go back to what another brilliant economist famously said, uh, Keynes, of course, um, uh, uh, said, and this is a man who learned it firsthand, is the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solid. So yeah. you're not going to be smarter than the market. Uh, I, I'm afraid of it. I'm rolling into real assets, but everybody, everybody's going to have your own taste for risk. Very good. Well, and so as we wrap up here, I did see, I think, a couple of questions asking if this uh, webinar has uh, been recorded. Yes, it has. And I think depending on how you're viewing this, I I can't tell, um, but there were Facebook Live. I think it might be uh, available right after this in terms of the recording. And then our team in terms of the Zoom, I think we ended up putting it, I think it's on YouTube, but that takes a little bit of time. But um, I think we email out a link for anyone who, who has you registered. If you gave us your email, we email that link. Or if you might be, you know, already subscribed to our YouTube, uh, you might get a notification once it's available. So yes, it's being recording, so you can uh, go back and and listen uh, to this again if you're of interest, or go to a particular section, and it should be available to you. If not immediately or soon on Facebook Live, then um, on uh, YouTube shortly. So again, Chris, thank you so much uh, for joining. To, uh, for sharing your great wisdom and insights and to our uh, members just thank you for your membership we really do appreciate uh, your business and we hope you know this this provided you some great information to help you think about you know what's next in the economy and help you make your own uh, decisions and if we didn't get to a question or you think of something later you know you listen to the webinar and you think of some questions we weren't able to get to live feel free to email us at new vision credit union at newvisioncu.org and we'll do our best to get back to you maybe with Chris's help. Uh, so with that, again, just thank you for, for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for your great presentation. And we hope everybody has outstanding holiday season. So thank you all. Thanks, Chris. Have a good night.